from London. Uh, we have a truly global audience with um, civil servants, public servants joining us from all around the world today. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you wherever you are watching this from. Um, my name is Siobhan Benita. I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's webinar, Responding to COP26, the task facing, Tasks Facing Civil Servants, on behalf of Global Government Forum, the publishing house that serves civil servants all around the world, and together with our knowledge partner, SAP. So in terms of today's topic, um, as the dust settles on COP26, civil servants all around the world now have the task of responding to the conference's conclusions. Working with experts across all sectors, as well as the wider public sector and citizen-led organizations, Policymakers face many urgent goals now, everything from greening power production to monitoring progress against carbon targets, to building resilience and protecting their populations and mobilizing climate finance. The challenges are significant. And there, I mean, there is no issue more important than this. And the civil servants really do have to turn those targets and that aspiration from Glasgow into reality. We have a truly stellar panel with us here today, and in a moment I will introduce our speakers, and they're going to be discussing, discussing all of those um, issues and much more. Each of our panel members will give some opening remarks, and then we will open up for discussion. But actually, this webinar is going to get really exciting when you, the audience, send in your questions. So there's going to be a good chance at the end of the presentations for us to take as many of those questions from you as we possibly can. So on whichever device you are watching this on, there should be a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Please, from now, at any point when you're listening to the presentations, um, send in the questions. And as I said, we will get through as many of those as we possibly can before the end of the webinar. So now to our brilliant panel. Um, first, we will hear from Anna Locke who is the Principal Research Fellow on Climate and Sustainability at the ODI Think Tank here in the United Kingdom. With some 20 years experience in development issues, Anna has particular expertise on developing agriculture to promote sustainable growth and reduce poverty. Her focus in recent years has been on land governance, biofuels and food security. Then we will hear from Thomas Christensen, who is the Climate Ambassador at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Climate, Energy and Utilities in Denmark. Thomas has a truly impressive climate CV. Prior to his current role, he was Senior Advisor to the UN Secretary General Ban, Ban Ki-moon, Assistant Secretary General at the United Nations and Chef de Cabinet for two Presidents of the General Assembly, with particular focus on implementation of the Paris Agreement and he also served as Denmark's ambassador to Iran and Egypt. Then we will hear from Jonas Denler, who is the global head of sustainability go-to market for SAP, our knowledge partner today. During his time at SAP, Jonas has been responsible for CO2 accounting, the rollout of a global environmental management system and various CO2 reduction initiatives like the green cloud, e-mobility or flight offsets. He was also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Swiss Climate Foundation and a member of the Investment Committee of the Livelihoods Fund. Then we will go over to uh, Sweden, where we will hear from Annika Christel, who is the UNFCC negotiator at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. As an environmental lawyer, she's part of the Swedish delegation coordinating mitigation issues and negotiating the items related to the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, in the Paris Agreement. She's also lead and co-chair in the Mitigation Expert Group of the European Union. And last, but by no means least, um, we will hear from Eddie Perez, who is International Climate Diplomacy Manager for the Climate Action Network in Canada. Eddie joined the network in January 2018 after working in Geneva with the Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change. He's also a lecturer at the University of Montreal and teaches climate justice and international cooperation. He's got particular expertise in climate diplomacy and chairs the G7 Climate and Energy Working Group within the G7 Global Task Force. So I'm sure you'll agree with me that we really do have a fantastic panel here today. Please do use this opportunity to pick their brains as much as you possibly can and send in your questions at any point. 
But without further ado, I'm going to invite Anna to give us the first presentation. Over to you, Anna. Thanks very much, Siobhan. And I, I am delighted to have the opportunity to, um, to participate in this with you know, so many people around the world who are on the front line of implementing national policies and international action to, um, to avert the, the climate emergency. Um, and if I could just go to my, my main slide on here, Alexa, thank you very much. This is um, an analysis uh, presented by Carbon Brief, which I would actually, if you, if you don't already subscribe to them, I really would recommend that you do subscribe to them. And it just gives us an overview of where we are at the moment, um, because the, you know, with all the hard work that went into the COP, um, the current policies today will still lead to a best estimate of, of warming of, um, to 2.6, 2.7 degrees by um, 2100. Now, if countries meet both conditional and unconditional nationally determined contributions um, for uh, 2030, that would fall to 2.4 degrees centigrade. Um, we've got another couple of you know, scenarios. If, every, if, if all countries meet their long-term net zero promises, um, global warming would be reduced to about 1.8 degrees Celsius. I mean, you can see where I'm heading with this because we're still not at the, the 1.5 that we need, uh, we know that we need to achieve. Um, there are um, you know, a whole set of announcements at COP, including the Global Methane um, Pledge, the Accelerated Coal Phase-Out, Business Pledges, um, as part of the Race to Zero campaign, um, which may um, shave off an additional you know, 0.1 degree warming um, of what was implied under commitments up to 2030. And similarly, you know, India's new net zero pledge by 2070 should you know, reduce projected global temperature rise by about um, 0.2 degrees. Now that is if all countries meet their long-term net zero promises. And this, this brings me to the point about what you can do in your positions overseeing national and international climate policy. And for me, there are two um, broad areas where I think you have uh, an exceptionally important role to play. One is increasing transparency and accountability so those commitments are actually fulfilled. And the second one is raising ambition so that we can we can start really chipping our way um, and making sure we have a, a buffer, a sort of a safety margin um, for achieving that um, maximum of 1.5 degrees uh, warming. So if we think about the increasing transparency and accountability, one of the challenges is that the multiple pledges made actually fall outside of the accountability mechanism of, of COP. And there is increased potential for fungibility or movement of finance which, um, between pledges and double counting. So your job, I would say, starts with making sure that the money is actually committed to concrete actions and that those actions are well designed, targeted and effective. And to do that, you need an overarching assessment of the value, use and impact of all those pledges, which means you need some really good um, data and analysis. Some of that you'll be able to source um, within your own government departments. Uh, you know, other, other parts of that you'll need to look outside um, for experts. And you need a mechanism to hold governments and the private sector account. Um, and let's think about what parts civil servants can play when you, you know, have to work with political appointees. And I, I, you know, I was a civil servant for about 10 years. Um, so I've, I've been in your position. Um, I think what can really uh, help is to build alliances and having champions within your departments, across departments and across countries, um, providing openings to ensure that different voices are heard um, and understanding and, and sort of helping shape the rising public pressure and the lit uh, you know, alerting political staff to that pressure so that they, they can be much more aware of how it will affect their, their own ability to do their job. And in terms of raising ambition, um, I know Eddie is going to talk about, you know, climate diplomacy. I think, you know, a range of the other panelists, they're experts on this. I'll leave it to them to talk about that. But what I think is very important is getting the right voices involved at national level. You know, we, we've been doing a lot of work looking at indigenous peoples and local communities um, and the, the part they play in reducing deforestation. Lot of you know, there's a lot of IPLC delegations going to going to COPs. 
if they're not part of national delegations, if they can't influence national policy, actually their ability to influence international policy is going to be very limited. And there are three other things I would say that are important in raising ambition that, that you and your jobs can do. One is, you know, band together with people and sort out the UN architecture so we can join up actions across the three environmental conventions and have a, have a race to the top, pull that incredible knowledge and, and science that um, the, the UN has across those three conventions and get them to really join forces and push all in the same direction. Build alliances with like-minded governments. I think the, what the pledges have shown us, um, pledges such as the uh, just rural transitions, is that you can join hands again with like-minded governments and lead by example and get the carbon markets and the non-market mechanisms sorted so um, you can get the right finance to the right people in, in good time. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Anna. That's a really good way to start because I think you've set the context in terms of so much has been done, so much has been achieved or promised, but even then, with all of that said, we're still not meeting that target that scientists say we need to do to keep uh, the warming to below 1.5 degrees. So showing that there's still a lot more to be done, like what you said in terms of what can civil servants do? Because our audience is primarily a civil service audience, so the emphasis there on helping to increase transparency of what's already been agreed, but making sure as well that redu the reductions as they're counted are genuine, that there's no kind of double counting going on, that you look across those UN um, conventions as well to join up, get the science consistent, get the approach um, consistent, make alliances across government departments um, and countries. And then the real importance of not just helping political leaders to do what they said they do, but holding them to account as well in terms of delivery. Thank you so much, Anna, a really good way uh, to kick us off. Now I'm going to invite Thomas for his comments. Thank you, Siobhan, and, uh, and thank you all for, for spending time with us. Um, uh, this is a really difficult subject, and, and I would start with acknowledging that uh, no matter when the world you are, uh, the fact that you're even spending time listening to us must mean that you personally feel engaged in this subject and and want to take personal action and, and agency and i welcome i welcome your your effort in doing so um let me spend just a few minutes taking you behind the scenes of cop 26 in glasgow um uh, denmark was asked uh, by the uk presidency to co-facilitate the the text on mitigation uh, in the in the glasgow uh, climate pact um, and and let, let me just share a few observations from that with you. Um, the first one being, and, and, and Annika made it look so easy with her figures in the slide, but, but what is really astonishing for, for us negotiators and people who, who do this um, on a daily basis is that um, the figures that, Annika, uh, that, that Anna showed were not contested. Uh, for the first time ever at a COP, no one questioned the science, no one questioned the urgency, no one questioned that we would come out with an emissions gap. And this might sound trivial to everyone, but it is actually not because this, these are issues that we've spent years and years bickering on and, and actually wasted uh, a lot of time uh, amongst governments um, arguing about. And it was clear already going into Glasgow uh, from the consultations that we conducted prior to Glasgow that this would actually not be an issue. And, and so our recommendation going into Glasgow to the UK was to, to be bold and to think big and to be ambitious in terms of what, also what kind of, um, what kind of decisions could be taken in Glasgow. And, and if you haven't uh, read the Glasgow Climate Pact yet, I would, I would actually suggest that you find it and, and do, um, uh, because it is, it is a very remarkable so-called cover decision, a political decision. It, it is, um, uh, probably the most ambitious political decision ever, ever we've ever had at a COP. Um, it, it is not a new uh, uh, treaty or a, it does, it's not a new uh, Paris agreement, but in some ways it, it actually is a, a sharpening and, and strengthening of, of the Paris agreement, of the agreement amongst governments on how to move forward. And, and it, um, in Paris, we had a definition of climate ambition that was very much focused on reducing emissions. 
uh, what the Glasgow Climate Pact does is that it expands the definition of ambition to cover both um, uh, emissions reductions, but also uh, adaptation and finance. So it's it's a it's a multi-dimensional uh, definition of ambition, and and on um, uh, emissions reduction, it is now not contested by anyone that we need to stay below 1.5 degrees. In, in, in the Paris Agreement, it talks about uh, two and possibly 1.5. 1.5 is now the threshold. Um, there is a decision to uh, ask all governments to come back next year, uh, those who haven't done so yet, to submit their NDCs uh, in order to improve on the pledges that, that you saw in Anna's chart, but also for everyone who has done so to review their, their uh, national climate plans in order to further strengthen them to be aligned with this 1.5 target. Uh, there's a lot more on, on net zero and 2050 targets, uh, which has also now become a, a concept in a, in a UN text. Net zero wasn't before. Um, there's a decision to have a work program under the, under the, um, under the Paris Agreement work. Uh, there's, a, there's a decision to have a ministerial to have an annual um, synthesis report done by the UNICCC that shows us how far we are in terms of, of reducing the emissions gap in, in, in the pledges and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly tightened implementation regime for Paris uh, that moves us from a five-year cycle to an annual cycle, at least until the gap is closed. But secondly, on finance, there's a, there's a commitment from donors to close the funding gap to the 100 billion, but also to engage in a post, the so-called post-2025 process that is a, a, a process that will lead to a new financing target. And on adaptation, there's a, there's a commitment to double adaptation finance, but also to work on a global goal on, on adaptation and a process for that. And then finally, there's a, there's a whole new, um, new uh, piece of work that has to take place on loss and damage. And specifically on financing loss and damage, which was a request from, from developing countries. And then there were all the negotiations on the Paris rule book, uh, the accountability mechanism, the transparency, the carbon credit market, and so on that were finished. So in a way, I mean, the, the Paris, uh, the, 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 the Glasgow Climate Act is a very comprehensive piece of work that, that sets new standards and new benchmarks for, for all the major pieces of, of, of the Paris Agreement. And, um, and uh, now it's really for all of us to uh, come, uh, well, starting from, from now, to work on the implementation of, of this pact. And, and that's where I, I would appeal to everyone who's listening and, and who's looking at this, that, that you personally, uh, you can take agency, you can, you can break uh, the silos within your government, you can help your leadership to, uh, to live up to what they have committed to. Um, uh, ministers and, and presidents and prime ministers who have shown a lot of courage and political will to agree to this once they are back in their daily grind in your country. Uh, they fall into the routine of policy making, other priorities. And, and we really all as civil servants have a, almost a duty now to keep ourselves uh, uh, on track and, and to help our governments, um, uh, national, local um, governments on, on track to deliver whether it is through policy, whether it, it's through engaging with the, the private sector, investors, your local community, um, uh, even engaging in partnerships or, or engaging youth and indigenous groups. So there are many ways to do this, but, but, but you also have to know that you are not alone. Um, when when uh, this started out, it was very much in an env environmental and climate community, but this transformation that we're going through and that we have to go through as a global community um, touches upon every bit of economic activity, social activity in society. And we have to realize that this is a very comprehensive, uh, all-encompassing process that we, are, that we are going through that takes the agency of each and every one of us. And I would, I would echo Anna's comments that um, while, while it is important that we all take agency in our national environment, it also has to be done in a global context. Um, the solutions we're looking at as a, as a, as a global humanity, uh, for lack of a, of a smaller word, uh, really no, no country, not even the largest economies in the world can do it on their own. And we saw it with the pandemic that we all were losing when we closed down our borders and tried to go it alone. And it will be the same with the climate challenge. It is, it is such a huge uh, uh, global um, 
threat that, that really the, the, the way ahead to stay below 1.5 degrees is something we have to do collectively. Um, and, and maybe just to end with that, just remember 1.5 degree is not a target. It's, it's, it's where we shouldn't arrive at. One, one vulnerable country said that very, very sharply in, the, um, in, in one of the final plenaries. Just remember, it's not our ambition to get to 1.5, it's our ambition to stay below. So the fact that some people might talk about a, a, a carbon budget or, or there's still uh, so many gigatons we can put into the atmosphere before we reach 1.5, that's, that's a fallacy. We should, we should not reach that, um, that threshold. And, um, and finally, just to say thank you to everyone that we also managed to get fossil fuels onto the agenda of the climate talks. That is really a, a, a groundbreaking uh, achievement that we managed to keep that in the text, which means that uh, forever going forward, uh, fossil fuels, uh, coal, uh, oil and gas will be part of the conversation at the table. You might turn your eyes and say, uh, uh, what have you been doing for 25 years? But friends, uh, unfortunately, that's the reality of the climate talks. We've spent 25 years not talking about what causes uh, climate change, what's the primary cause, but now it's there. So thanks a lot, Shubhan. Thanks, Thomas. A really nice way to build on Anna's opener, I think, because you could, I think, look at this and well, we didn't achieve everything that we wanted to achieve, but actually what you've set out there, that kind of plea first to civil servants, please read the Glasgow Pact, but then highlighting some of those things that actually did get achieved, you know, really important things, as you said, the the fact that the, um, the data isn't contested anymore, the fact that they're focusing on solutions rather than arguing about the scale of the problem, really important. The fact that there are, you know, everybody working towards the net zero targets, closing the finance gap, the fossil fuels being kept in, um, all of those things really showing real progress and that there are much more detailed plans than we've ever had before. And this sense that countries are gonna be held to account now on this annual cycle. So there's much less wriggle room to not be doing what they've agreed to do. And just finally, before we move on, both you and Anna now have both mentioned that global need, this has to be done on a global level, but also how do you make sure then that the voices of the most vulnerable don't get left behind, that they are integrated into uh, national kind of delegations as well. Thank you so much, Thomas and Anna. And now I'm gonna invite Jonas to give us his comment. Hello everyone. And also from my side, thank you very much for for having me, I kind of speak up for the voice of uh, technology, or in other sense, what I'm speaking for, for SAP, one of the largest uh, software companies in the world, and definitely the largest uh, business enterprise uh, company in the world. So our focus is across all industries. So we directly serve definitely also the public sector, but also have a huge uh, and an important role to play in all the other industries, basically helping them to optimize on their processes. Now with the link to sustainability, we see ourselves as an enabler for sustainability. So with, with, with our technology or with, with IT technology in general, you basically can support the businesses and the organizations out there to increase the transparency and the insights so that they can make informed decision. So the way we, we used to, to look at it, when you look at the sustainable enterprise, that's basically an enterprise that has full control and insight into their own processes, but at the same time also is accountable or responsible for the value chain. So everything that they actually produce goes through the whole value chain. And if, if you can make them accountable and responsible also for the action uh, in the, um, uh, along the whole value chain, then you actually can talk about the sustainable enterprise. And it's the, the role of SAP, or it's actually our mandate that we have such a huge uh, customer base to ensure that we have that uh, transparency within the company, but also across the, whole, across the whole value chain. I think you are in a similar role as well. So also a, an enabler for sustainability. You not directly can actually reduce the emission, but you can enforce the laws, you can enforce the legislation that will push the businesses, that will push the industries in, the, in this direction. And when I can now kind of think what I would also see you or how you can 
evolve also in your role. It goes in this exactly the same dimension that uh, that Thomas and Anna said about this international collaboration. The way I look at it is more a bit from a standard setting point of view. If you look at global enterprises, they're active in many different markets around the globe. So we also should make sure that the, the goals, the markets, the standards that we set with regard to sustainability legislation are aligned. They do not need to be the same, but they need to kind of collaborate and be coordinated with each other. So this is definitely some, some point that I wanted to, to emphasize here as well. The other side, and I think there it's much more a, a, a proactive role that you can take is actually to motivate you to actively collaborate. The way we see it now in the sustainability space, and this is really interesting because it's not only B2B anymore, it's evolving here. We talk about mission-based ecosystems. So that we basically define a, a joint vision and a very strong mission as well attached to it and have incentivized participants that actually then support the cause of this vision and the mission and all of them are complementary. So I give you an example how we came up with, um, with uh, a new vision. No, not that we came up, but how we contributed in, in one of these ecosystems for a vision for plastic-free oceans. This was not the purpose or vision of, of SAP only, but we contributed from a technology point of view together with our technology partners. And we worked together with governmental and non-governmental organizations like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we clearly work together with them, setting kind of the standards, setting the vision, and how we can execute on that. On the third pillar of this triangle, we then work with businesses that really helped and engage in an early stage. So they helped to basically develop the technology, the software solution, but at the same time also provided clear feedback to the policymakers how the policy can actually be rolled out further or maybe even adapted or changed. So I think this uh, mission-based ecosystem that we see now also developing in many other areas, in many other uh, topics that are evolving uh, and, and uh, resulting now out of, of uh, COP26, that this is like actually a key role where not only IT companies, where not only businesses, but also governance and uh, the public sector plays an important role to support uh, a, a joint goal. So saying this, I kind of look forward to, to hear and, and learn more from, uh, from the panelists and also from the participants in the call and looking forward to your questions and hope that I can, can answer those uh, afterwards. Brilliant, thank you so much, Jonas. It's great to have that perspective on the panel because as you said, you know, we'll only achieve this, I think, if we all work together. So the public sector, the private sector, working with enablers like yourself on the kind of IT, side and the technology side have to be working together. Um, interesting what you said there, we might have some thoughts on that from our other panel members of the audience on the role of governments and the civil service to set those standards and the kind of legal framework in which companies uh, then understand that they have to operate. So being really clear for companies on the kind of targets that they need to meet um, themselves. And a really nice example you gave there of um, working together with public sector organizations, the private sector organizations on things like the Plastic Free Ocean um, Initiative. So there's a real role for everybody in this and everybody's gonna have to come together if we want to achieve those targets that have been agreed. Thank you so much, Jonas. I'm now gonna invite Annika to speak. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this webinar. This is such an important topic and I couldn't agree more with Thomas that we all must do what we can now. If I could just start with a few reflections about COP26, and my perspective is very much focused on the mitigation part, since that's what I work on. I think this COP was different from earlier, and especially compared to COP25 in Madrid. I think that everyone was aware that we had lost a lot of time during the pandemic, while at the same time the research has become even more clear and people are experiencing climate change in many different ways all the time, all over the world. For example, the indigenous people of Europe, the Sami, who live in the northern parts of my country, Sweden, as well as Norway, Finland and Russia, are very affected by climate change since the changes are more rapid close to the North Pole. Now the research is backing up what they have been saying for many years. So the research is doing its part and people are becoming more and more aware and creating more pressure on the politicians. 
in that context, I think the time was right for COP26 and also that the COP presidency contributed to the result we got. There was a big pro uh, progress, as Thomas explained, but also there is more to do, of course, as Anna pointed out. So we are now in a situation where we have the Paris Agreement and the rule book, but we need to implement all of it now. And this is what I would like to focus on today. Uh, the round of new or updated nationally determined contributions or NDCs that almost all countries have communicated during 2020 and 2021 was the first round of contributions that were created knowing the rules in the Paris Agreement. The first round uh, were produced in 2015 before the Paris Agreement existed. So we are very much in a learning process. Some of us have also produced long-term climate strategies for the first time in accordance with the invitation in 2020 in the Paris Agreement. Now the cover decision from COP26 urged more parties to produce these strategies before next COP. And um, we will also have a synthesis report focusing on these long-term strategies before next COP. According to a report from the OECD, there are big differences between these strategies as well as a lack of information about how different countries plan to get to net zero. So one important factor during the implementation phase is that we need to work together and share experiences and best practices as we work towards our mutual temperature goal. Another important factor for the implementation phase is getting everyone on board. Moving towards implementation of the rules we have agreed is a tremendous challenge for us all, and we will have to, do, to move fast since the development the coming 10 years will determine if we make the 1.5 degrees target. Not even my country, Sweden, is on track when it comes to implementation. This is the case this, despite the fact that it's, it's a small country and it, it has an ambitious target. So my guess is that getting the public on board will be crucial in the implementation phase and that civil servants have a big role to play in this process. Many of us working for governmental agencies and in similar places understand what a big task that lays before us and how the transition towards net zero will affect every country, every region and every uh, sector. People in Sweden are, according to what I have heard, uh, the most well-informed people when it comes to climate change. But even so, I do not believe that people here understand what the transition comprises. So we need to help people understand the transformation that needs to be undertaken by making the quite abstract conversation about climate change easier and clearer for people to understand, especially with regard to the changes, um, what the changes will mean for people in their day-to-day -day lives. And our political systems are perhaps not the best uh, for long-term change. Our governments may be elected for three or four year periods. And if politicians want to be re-elected or elected in the first place, they might not wish to impose rules that will affect people in negative ways or impinge on people's freedom to choose. So people need to accept and want the changes that are necessary instead of voting for politicians that want to go the wrong way. So the way I see it, we need to go from abstract and complicated and, and try to paint a picture of what the future could look like and highlight the good things that will come out of this transition and the co-benefits we can get from decreasing emissions and working towards a more sustainable way of life in general. If we use energy and resources in a more efficient way, I'm sure um, that both the environment and people would benefit, for example, through better or and safer jobs. So, um, I do not have all the answers and I cannot say what the future should look like, but I know that a lot of people have started thinking about this, as we have also heard from other panelists here today. And I think we, the civil servants, need to work with them to figure this out and to get the public on board if, um, if this transi transition is going to happen. Thank you. Thanks, Annika. Um, really um, interesting to hear what you say there about good that more and more countries now have their plans and strategies in place, but still not consistent in the how those countries are going to implement those strategies. And there your plea to civil servants again, what can they do to help? Well, that, that um, task of um, working with the public to increase the understanding of the public so that the public then are the ones putting pressure 
on the politicians. And um, absolutely, civil servants will understand this. The political cycle doesn't help because sometimes it's very hard for politicians to make those decisions um, that maybe aren't going to be that popular with the voting public. So actually, if the public get behind this, then that's um, another way forward. So that education piece is really important. Thank you so much, Annika. Just a call to the audience. Thank you so much. I can see the questions coming in already. Please, if you've got questions, keep them coming. And then last but not least, I'm going to ask Eddie to give us his opening remarks. Thank you, Shivan, and, and thank you to all the panelists and to the Global Government Forum for giving me the opportunity to speak about COP26. Um, I am based in Jojage, which is uh, commonly known as Montreal, Quebec, but I'm still in Glasgow um, at the moment um, uh, because of uh, COVID-19 uh, got me stuck in, in, in Glasgow. I am enjoying this beautiful city uh, right now. I'm fully recovered. Uh, so uh, that is um, that is progress in my uh, in my view. I do want to maybe touch upon uh, an issue that I feel is at the core of um, this discussion, which is for me, um, I do see public servants as the guardians of public trust. Um, and I want to touch upon that issue uh, and and maybe build upon some of the comments that were made earlier. It is true that there was some progress made in Glasgow, technical progress in Article 6, critical progress on transparency, progress on finance. Um, also glad to hear Thomas from Denmark, uh, who both um, was the country that launched the Beyond Go Oil and Gas Alliance and at the same time led the mitigation uh, discussions with the presidency. And I do see uh, that um, you know, uh, Denmark had a very particular role in Glasgow and, and, and thank you for always driving that ambition to reprioritize 1.5, which I feel it is uh, the overarching outcome of Glasgow, reprioritizing 1.5 uh, against two degrees and making sure that uh, keeping 1.5 within reach is the main narrative um, uh, moving forward. But I wanna touch upon three uh, growing disconnects that COPs are exacerbating, uh, which if not addressed, will negatively impact what you civil servants actually protect the most, which is public trust. Um, and you know these disconnects happen at a moment when cops are being exposed to respond to urgent uh, and non-traditional priorities uh, from deforestation to ocean conservation to plastics to trade, the issues that at the you know, um, very least are not discussed within the COP space, but are uh, actually being brought in by force because the markets are saying it, because politicians want to talk about it, because we know that the urgency requires that we don't uh, tackle the climate change in silos. That said, um, the disconnects are actually showing some of the things that I feel civil servants that engage in the COP process need to think through both at the domestic and at the international level. The first one is that COP is becoming a space for flashy announcements that don't pa pass the test of accountability and are too far from, you know, those issues that are being negotiated in the rooms. So for example, the same day we talked about finance, there was this announcement from um, uh, Mark Carney uh, and, and the, the, the 100 trillion of dollars in assets put uh, towards the contribution of net zero. Uh, and you know there were questions about the accountability of it. Other colleagues have talked about that. But it was the same day that we, we were talking about the inadequacy of the 100 billion and how far we were from meeting uh, uh, though the, the target. We also saw announcements on deforestation um, that uh, didn't also meet the bar of accountability at the same time where we were discussing about the loopholes on Article 6. And so um, when we start making the dots between what happens in this uh, uh, um, outside spaces where these announcements are taking place and what's being negotiated, uh, if those announcements don't pass the accountability test, it hurts the public trust because we're unable to make the connection between the, the political reality of the announcements and how they're gonna help us keep 1.5 within reach. The second one that I see is um, the scaling up 
um, of a kind of a repression or violation of rights. And it's not me using this word. This is the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights that talked about uh, this and sent a letter to the UNFCCC Secretariat of many who are actively participating in the implementation of Paris pledges, uh, but at the same time continuously face blocking and obstruction to be in the negotiating rooms. Glasgow, I think, was the ceiling of uh, that experience when actually it was not only um, uh, non-state actors that were um, stopped from participating in the process, but also negotiators from climate vulnerable countries uh, and small countries who were not able to be in the rooms. Of course, part of it is related to the logistics, but it did show that, um, you know, the, 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 now that we talk about the implementation of the Paris Agreement, um, non-state actors are continuously treated as observers when indigenous peoples are implementers of the Paris Agreement. It can't happen unless we engage them. And, I, and I'm glad to hear other um, civil servants and colleagues talk about that earlier, but we did see the opposite in Glasgow. And, you know, some, some might say this is the UN process, it has its limitation, but at the same time, the UN is also a government-led institution. And so if there is ambition in making sure that we hear the voices of those communities and groups that need to be represented in these spaces, it is governments who need to champion these transformational changes so that the voices are heard. Um, and you know, it is important also to acknowledge that COP26 was a painful, experience for many non-state actors who traveled around the world to come to this space, uh, bring their experience and expertise, and then finally uh, face so much obstruction uh, in the negotiation process. The third one, and I think the biggest disconnect that I see is that I do agree that these technical prog progress is important. I do agree that it is, uh, we, we have a basis to build upon um, in the coming months and uh, in the process towards uh, COP27. But I feel that in the context of public trust, the, the, um, the current way in which we're talking about keeping 1.5 within reach um, doesn't seem urgent. It does not seem as we are talking about the climate emergency. It does seem as if we are prioritizing COP26. It does seem as we're talking about climate diplomacy as an important critical cross-cutting issue, but it does not reflect the level of urgency that we're hearing on the streets and that many climate vulnerable country voices are bringing to the room. And I feel that part of the reason for that is that, you know, we tend to have this uh, sentence about all feeling equally unsatisfied with a COP26 or a COP outcome uh, period. But what we saw at COP26 is that we continue to see keeping 1.5 within reach as an element of different trade-off when I actually feel that keeping 1.5 within reach is actually an important element of cooperation. And it is just through cooperation within governments and at the international level that we can understand why some of these priorities that were brought into the room needed to ta be taken much more seriously than they did in Glasgow. And it is a question of partnership, both for mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage, because they need to be financed in different ways, but they were not given the same level of prioritization that, that climate vulnerable countries and many communities wanted. So we do have an opportunity to correct that as we move forward towards COP27. But, you know, I do feel that as a way forward, what I please civil servants moving forward is for them to take into consideration the beauty of being the guardians of public trust. Because if, if you take that um, role uh, and I, I'm sure you do, because I know Canadian public servants do it, uh, and I'm, I'm really happy to always work with them. It is a matter of accountability. It is a matter of cooperation, but at most of radical solidarity. Thank Thanks, you. Eddie. Thank you so much, Eddie. I, I mean, I think 
It's a great way to end that set of presentations because we started with a bit of a challenge. We've heard about all of the progress that's been made and the real progress that's been made and then another challenge at the end that we need to do more. I really like the way you frame it there. I think important for the audience, public servants as the guardians of public trust. So we've raised these expectations with these big announcements of what might be achieved. But actually, as you're saying, there's this risk of this real disconnect between that and what was actually being negotiated at the very detailed level. And actually, it's up to now public servants, civil servants, to make sure that we do actually implement and to drive that urgency forward as well. So really good to end with that bit of challenge there as well at the end. Thank you so much to all those wonderful presentations that has set the scene for the conversation so well. We're getting questions coming in. Before I dive into the audience questions, I just want to ask one very simple thing um, from all of you. Um, we've kind of been here before. We've had promises from politicians before. They've never quite been met, you know, the, the, the promises that have been um, agreed in the past. I just very quickly want a sense from all of you. To what extent do you think this is different now? Have we reached a turning point? We've mentioned some of the, the things that have been done for the first time. Are you more confident now that we are going to reach even those targets that have been agreed, whether that's enough or not, another issue, but are we gonna meet those targets that have been signed up to um, in Glasgow? Thomas, I'm gonna start with you. Well, thank you, Subban. I mean, very briefly, it all comes down to how good we are at kickstarting implementation at, at speed and scale. Uh, there are a whole range of, of um, senior leaders from uh, governments from around the world who have put their hand on the boilerplate in the trust that they will uh, get support and, and that we all will step up and, and, and help them deliver on their ambition uh, when it comes to emissions reductions. Um, and, and, and by the way, I, I actually don't agree with Eddie's last point about that disconnect. I, I think everyone at, in Glasgow felt the urgency and the need to act. And I think the reason why we got the Glasgow Pact was because everybody felt that uh, no discussion of science and so on, what I said before. But, but um, it's also clear that if we fail the ambitions of those leaders and of the most vulnerable, um, the, the trust that we managed to regain in Glasgow will be squandered very easily and very fast. And because we are now on a one year, uh, I mean, time loop, the, 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 uh, my fear is that our systems as civil servants and as, as public organizations won't adjust in time and that the next COP in, in Sham will be a big disappointment because we are, we are running behind in terms of getting up to speed with the uh, taking the action that's needed mm -hmm. and that goes both for our national actions but also for putting in place those uh, regulatory frameworks those standards that that, um, that jonas was talking about because he's right i mean yeah. for for transformation of major industries and major transport sectors uh shipping aviation etc uh, it's not one country that can really do that we have to agree on a new set of standards collectively that that all can live up to and and, 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 and those things take, unfortunately, quite some time. And, and yeah. to, to take that collective uh, will and ambition that everybody who was, and I agree with Annika, everybody was really up to their best behavior in Glasgow. No one wanted to walk away with a failure. And when the, in the end was a push against uh, for, having fossil mentioned in the, in the agreement, you saw uh, countries from all around the world, large, small, developed, developing, everybody spoke out and basically, pushed back on, on keeping that focus also in the in the final outcome. And then um, uh, can we really translate that that collective political will into the urgency of action that is needed? That's that's where I have my biggest uh, my biggest yeah. fear. Yeah. So you're disagreeing with Eddie on the fact that people didn't maybe feel the urgency, but you're agreeing with Eddie on maybe we can't actually meet that urgency despite wanting to. Annika, you were kind of nodding there a little bit. Do you do you have similar concerns to Thomas on, uh, you know, are we actually going to meet these agreements? Do you think the machinery is too slow to, to respond? Yeah, I, I would say I agree very much with what Thomas said. Um, although I am more hopeful now after COP26 since um, I already talked about um, that I that I do feel that there is a difference and um, but I still feel that we need a critical mass of people to 
be on board and, and to want these, um, these changes. And uh, 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 what I worry most about is probably the time, um, if we can do this fast enough. Yeah, thanks, Annika. Jonas, from your experience, I mean, you mentioned technology is going to be an enabler in some of these. Do you think that governments are more open now to working with kind of technology organizations with the private sector to help drive change and, and increase the pace? Absolutely. And, and as I said uh, in the beginning, it's not just uh, this relationship between technology and the public sector, it's actually also with the industries. And there I definitely can say that the businesses start to act. In many areas, they do not really know how to tackle it. So there's also a lot of enabling that needs to happen within the, within the industries, uh, but they definitely kind of start to act. Is it because of increasing legislation and they now also see their businesses at risk? That's definitely one driver. But the other one I see is that they also see a great opportunity so that sustainability also can be linked to a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that helps now to the private sector also to move to move forward. I think uh, coming back again to this triangle, this could be extremely, extremely helpful collaborating on that and, and, and solving these challenges together. Thanks, James. Anna, you started with a bit of a challenge. I mean, how optimistic are you that these targets will be met this time? Um, I... Yeah, I have very mixed emotions. I think like everybody, I, you know, I came away from COP feeling and, um, you know, energized, but very fearful um, that, that we won't make it and that the systems won't work fast enough. I think that there are, I, I think Jonas's point about linking sustainability to business opportunities, it felt like there was unprecedented engagement by the private sector and that the, you know, the, the, the ship is turning for, uh, for them. Um, and I am optimistic that that can actually lead to change. The, the second thing that makes me optimistic, I attended the, the Friday's Future March in, in Glasgow. And the, you, know, the, you had primary school um, children there, you had young activists from all over the world, and that the energy and actually the, the anger in that group was, mm. you know, was tangible. Um, and I was very struck by something that um, you know, former President Barack Obama said, you know, speaking very much to the youth in the audience and the, and the young at heart, he said, um, <laughs> uh, he, he was saying, get involved in politics. And I do feel that that really getting that vote mobilized, making sure that people do um, feel that their vote counts. And that comes back to that point about, about trust. And I do think civil servants have a lot to, you know, a big role to play. I'd, I'd place my, um, I think I'd place my faith and my optimism in those two things being very different. I think that, you know, civil servants working in this area have been working very, very hard. I mean, someone like Thomas and, you know, and Annika, they've been working for such a long time trying to, trying to move this along, um, you know, wholeheartedly committed to the, you know, to changing things for the better. Um, I would love to hear actually from Thomas and Annika whether they feel that they have a groundswell of, of support that could, could help them in their, in their quest to change things. Thank you. Thanks. I'll come back on that. Our, um, question to Annika and Thomas in a minute because I think it links to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. Eddie, very quickly, so you you really pushed on trust and urgency. Are you in any way more optimistic now than you were maybe five years ago, two years ago, that we will meet some of these targets? I am. I am actually very optimistic. I, I feel like, uh, you know, the disconnect is, is there because, you know, we're moving towards the mo much more rapid implementation of the Paris Agreement, and we want many to put forward uh, uh, a greater commitments. And I think the way that we respond to, to it is how do we bring it back home and add a layer of accountability that is needed. Uh, but you know, my optimism is not necessarily on the words that are in the Glasgow Pact, it's actually on the rising mobilization. And I give you the example of Canada, Canada came to Glasgow with a much more higher performance that 
any time before at any other COPs, an enhanced NDC, a doubling of climate finance pledge, a net zero accountability law, a carbon pricing mechanism, the ability to uh, sign on to the global methane pledge, the ability to speak about fossil fuel subsidies at the international level, things that were not expected years before. And I feel that part of the reason why that was possible is because there is a rising mobilization at the domestic level that is pushing the country mm -hmm. towards those goals. So there is, as uh, others have talked about, that the importance of you know, civil servancy to look at what the population and what the different movements at the domestic level are saying and are interpreting when talking about the climate urgency and the ways in which we could act. Thanks, Eddie. Well, that brings us really nicely on to, to both the question I think that Anna put um, to Annika and Thomas about, is there this groundswell of support? Do you feel that's helpful in your countries? But also we've had two questions in from the audience, which I'm going to combine. So one is from Brent Waite, who has asked, to what degree is culture change being considered for the timelines? And in particular, when we are requiring like the public to do difficult things, you know, with their heating, their housing, changing their vehicle use, those kind of things. So to what extent is that being factored in and how should civil servants think about that? And then we had a question in advance from Mariana Thompson, um, who is from uh, the United States, I think. And, and she has said, you know, in the United States, with the change of administration, there has been a change uh, coming back to the table, maybe on climate change, which is great. But there are still quite a lot of people in the United States who don't yet believe that climate change is real. So that whole education piece, to what extent the civil servants have to put a lot of emphasis or kind of educating the public, because you've all mentioned the importance of getting that the public behind you know Annika you mentioned this a lot in your presentation so just some thinking there around kind of what should civil servants be thinking about in terms of culture change where are the difficult challenges going to be in getting the public behind them and to what extent should this be a priority now um Anna I'm going to come to you first on this one I'm so sorry, Siobhan, I was I was jotting down the second the second question um, about about culture change and thinking about that. Would you mind just sort of? Yeah, sure. So it's I guess it's combining all of those elements, really. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in all your presentations, you kind of all mentioned the importance of the public and getting the public behind this, not least to keep pressure on the politicians to deliver. But we've had two questions in in particular. One is um, the extent to which civil servants are thinking about culture change and how they are. <laughs> building that into the timeline so actually can you you know you're going to have to change behaviors in the public in terms of you know the way they heat their houses the modes of transport that they use so to what extent is that being factored in into timelines and then a very specific question from the United States where you still have a significant percentage of the population who don't yet even buy into climate change as a reality who don't even believe that climate change is happening. So I guess it's just a question about to what extent the civil servants have to think about communication to the public on these issues and where is it gonna be the trickiest to change public behavior? What do you think the challenges are gonna be the most difficult? Thanks. Thanks very much, Siobhan. I think those questions do, you know, do get right to the heart of the matter. I mean, I taking the, the question about, I mean, I think there, there, there are two things that need to be done. It's one is persuasion and the other is applying pressure. Um, and I'd say throughout that, it's really about listening to people and understanding their concerns. I, I actually also used to feel that a significant you know, portion of the public in certain countries like the US uh, were hardline climate skeptics. I've read some, some things um, which have persuaded me otherwise. And the advice that has come out from that, which is all about um, you know, tapping into behavior and how to, how to persuade people, it's don't, don't, don't let the hard climate skeptics take up too much um, airtime and, and actually air and energy. There is a large swathe of the population which are undecided. Focus your energies on those people. You're never going to persuade actually what is, is actually fairly, you know, a fairly small um, proportion of the population to change their minds. So don't try, you know, aim for those, you know, for, for those undecided 
Um, and, you know, while you're trying to persuade them, actually fully understand their concerns, um, because it's not just a moral stance. There are people who are struggling to get by. You know, the buffer for, for them to actually change their lifestyles is a lot, is, is a lot smaller and a lot narrower than it is for maybe, you know, people like you and I. I actually, I think that advertising, smart advertising and nudges can be quite quite helpful. I mean, I remember just recently watching a, an advert on British TV, which was for replacing your gas boiler. Um, and I thought it would be perfect to place an advert right after it, which is talking about alternatives to gas boilers, because otherwise you're locking people into certain infrastructure. Um, and on the issue of, of, of culture and behavior, I don't think that we um, should forget that actually a lot of behavior is driven by systems and that by changing systems, um, you can, you, you know, you can actually influence behavior much more than asking people to, to change, you know, it, you know, modify and adjust their individual behavior. So we're doing work on sustainable and healthy diets. It's looking at food systems as a whole, looking at what food is, is made available, how it's made available, the, you know, the different incentives to buy, to buy food. Um, you can, you know, you can really make it much easier for people to change their behaviour okay. um, by by adjusting systems. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Annika, you talked quite a lot about, you know, even in even in a country like Sweden, where the population is relatively well educated, there's still more to do. Where do you think the biggest challenges are for civil servants in terms of changing people's behaviours and understanding? Yeah, I, I think that we have a lot of knowledge here. We have uh, companies talking about um, uh, environmental friendly and climate friendly products. We have uh, schools uh, making uh, food for the kids that uh, where they where, where they count how much um, CO2 they are emitting uh, through what they're eating. Uh, we have television shows about climate change. We have all of this, and, and the media has really picked up now and 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 talking a lot about. Um, uh, climate change. So, so I think at least here we are there and we have all the knowledge. I think the challenge now is, as I said, to get people to understand that uh, that there will need to be changes um, if we are going to to make it. And I think the cultural, the question about cultural changes, is very important because that we have to take that into account when we um, when we when we talk about um, how to get our policy tools um, going and we need to um, make sure that we have every uh, all the people on board uh, in this transition for example gender issues are very important mm -hmm. and getting getting the indigenous people on board because they have uh, many of the solutions that we need uh, so that's that's extremely important and I think that the tools we have in the Paris Agreement are there because we have nationally determined contributions mm -hmm. we decide ourselves how to mm -hmm. how to ma make the changes that we need in our own societies. Thanks, Annika. Thomas, I'm going to come to you and then I'll move on to some other questions. We've been getting so many in, but this issue of culture change, to what extent do you think the Danish population is already shifting, but do you think there's more to do and where are the big challenges? Well, I would say this, that, that the reason I'm in this job is because of a culture change. We had a national election two and a half years ago, which everybody thought was going to be about all sorts of other issues. And, and I was one of the few public servants in this country who said, no, I, the youth is going to turn this election into a climate election. And, and uh, in the last week before the election, you suddenly had young people with their parents and grandparents mobilizing in big numbers. And suddenly all parties had to, had to face up to their lack of action on climate. And actually it was a, it was a groundswell towards the green. And, uh, and within uh, six months, we had political agreement on with 95% of parliament behind it to, to have a very ambitious climate law, taking us to a 70% reduction in, in 2030. So it's very much about this, this combination of culture change, uh, mobilization of the youth that, that Eddie talked about, and then uh, changing that, turning that into political capital. And I think the same thing happened at European level in a way, because the, the, the European Green Deal and the policies coming from Brussels uh, defined by the commission also based on the outcomes of the European parliamentary elections in, in actually the same week we had our we had our national elections in June of 2019. And, and without that change, uh, we wouldn't be where we are now. I mean, then Europe wouldn't have had our ambition. 
the European high ambition has been in a way been driving China and, and, and some of the Asian countries and then brought the US in when, when the electoral change happened in the US. And, and I, I started in this job less than two years ago. And, and at that time, it was a clean slate. There was no ambition at all. And now we're actually in a situation where we can talk about keeping 1.5 within reach, but we have all these commitments and everything that came out of Glasgow. So I, I, I do think uh, we've moved an uh, incredible mountain in the last uh, less than two years. Um, and now it's really about implementing that. Um, I, I fully realize that this uh, uh, personal choice of, of vehicles and housing and, and what you do can seem uh, very unsurmountable and, and to some extent it is because most people they don't really make those choices they go for what's cheapest what's most convenient what's available uh, and, and, and for many the, the green solution is the most expensive one but I think with the, with the change that's happening in global markets we're actually driving cost of uh, green products and green solutions down and and, and then very soon in most markets, it, won't no, it will no longer be that choice between cost and, and availability and, and, and whether to do it in a, in a climate friendly way, even in the large emer emerging uh, economies, that, that, that's the case. Um, and and uh, I can see why as a, as a normal consumer, it, it's, uh, it's difficult, but, but if you take uh, an area like electric vehicles, in my country, we had a small change of the uh, of the VAT, and suddenly this year, uh, half of all vehicles sold are electric vehicles or hybrid. Yeah. Very small change, and the consumer was ready to make that choice. Um, yeah. uh, the, the shipping sector, uh, uh, Maersk, which is the world's largest container shipper, has now because of the demand from their customers who are primarily you know large consumer goods producers uh, of shoes and jackets and sportswear and the ikea and so on coming from asia to europe or the u.s market they are all uh, asking Maersk to ship green because their customers want it so now Maersk has uh, set a target to have their whole shipping fleet go uh, green sailing on on green liquid fuels produced by turning green energy through electrolysis into liquid hydrogen and uh, they've ordered the first eight ships in Korea and the whole fleet within the next 10, 15 years will go green. And as a, as a leader in the global uh, shipping market, they are driving the whole, the whole shipping sector with them. It's only after they've made those choices that politically we've, we've created a coalition that was launched in Glasgow to fully decarbonize shipping in the uh, International Maritime Organization. But we're actually as government running behind the industry there, not, yeah. not in front. And I think... Yeah. That, that's where we'll see more and more action happening, driven also by consumers. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. We really do have loads of questions coming in. Don't worry, if I don't manage to get to your question now, we will make sure that after the webinar, you get an answer. So we will make sure that all of those questions get answered anyway after the webinar. But I want to combine again two questions because I think they're about this global response. And again, I think in your presentations, you all mentioned the need for a kind of global uh, response to this issue. It's a global uh, problem, obviously. So Sarah Hertz has said, um, it's been mentioned there are some intersections between the pandemic and the response to the pandemic and the climate crisis. So do you think there's anything that we can learn from how the world has combated kind of the pandemic or is combating the, the pandemic um, as we go forward on climate change? And then Graham, who's from the Department of um, DEFRA here in the UK, has similarly said, is there kind of any, any thinking around a global communication plan, for example, so where countries could, could be looking at kind of um, measuring progress in other countries around the world so that you can see how everyone is doing. So is the world getting together in the way it needs to get together? And can we learn anything from the pandemic um, in this respect? Um, Jonas, I'm gonna to come to you. Do you think there are any similarities and, and are you seeing anything from the SAP point of view where you're seeing kind of more global collaboration happening, do you think, on this issue? Tricky question, because I, I, I think there are similar outcomes between uh, the climate change and uh, what we learn now with, uh, with Corona. There could be some, some uh, similar outcomes out of it, but the way it developed and where it come from, I mean, climate change, we're talking now over years, and we see it slowly, slowly progressing while the pandemic was here in in no time. Uh, I think maybe then in the adaption we can, can learn of it, but I really like the, the second part or the second question much more. How can we learn from each other? How can we also uh, 
kind of uh, copy with pride mm. so that you actually learn from from other cities from other countries about their legislations about their kind of um, best practices that they rolled out and how how can you then copy them and maybe even adjust them a little bit for your environment for 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 your cities for your for your country mm. and basically learn learn from them about measuring progress for sure this definitely needs to go much more into uh, fact based analysis so that we really can can also show and measure the progress but i mean I'm not sure if we, if there are any any topics that we have that we can measure in such detail as we actually can with the uh, climate change we have the currency we have more or less the global standards ready uh, and we even have the prediction with regard to the 1.5 degree uh, target so that there is everything is set we just need to leverage that and also try to uh, make the right conclusions out of the data that is available thanks jonas eddie i'm going to come to you is there more that you would like to see on a, on a kind of global level and have we learned anything from the pandemic response do you think yeah, I think I think there are actually a lot of similarities between the pandemic and the climate crisis, beginning by the fact that it has no borders, by the fact that it requires solidarity and global cooperation to tackle both COVID-19 and uh, the, the climate crisis. And that, you know, I think uh, something that we learned throughout the two years of the pandemic is the, the critical need of science uh, for public uh, purposes for public trust. Um, and I think that that applies as well to uh, tackling the climate crisis. But I do feel that one of the uh, greatest similarities between COVID and uh, our response to COVID and our response to the climate crisis is who gets hit first and who needs to uh, be um, it, you know, uh, uh, in response to those most vulnerable groups that um, to a certain extent, uh, when they got hit by the pandemic, um, they were also um, in, in, a, in a much more difficult position to respond to the climate mm -hmm. crisis. So you did see, for example, an increase on uh, debt sustainability, unsustainability because uh, many countries did not have um, uh, the funding to 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 eat to uh, provide public services to their communities, and so there is this very uh, similar linkage about the importance of putting the voices of those who um, are most impacted by the climate crisis at the forefront. They're already at the forefront, but not necessarily in the context of taking decisions. Um, and, and so then the other question is from the solutions that come out from both COVID and uh, climate, the, the, for me, there is just a clear question about who benefits from it, who benefits first, which leads me then to your other point about measuring progress. You know, um, something that was really clear in Glasgow, which to, to uh, I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge, we were able to somehow try to correct that situation is how unbalanced we used to see keeping 1.5 within reach in the context of mitigation and adaptation action. We, we already have an idea about the mitigation goal. We know that, you know, we need to limit global warming to 1.5 uh, and keep it below. We, that is a mitigation mm -hmm. goal. But if I ask you, what is our adaptation goal? You know, <laughs> maybe I think uh, no one in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, a group will tell what, what, what that really, really means. And yeah. so that is because we haven't actually given ourselves the opportunity that that's going to start with the global goal and adaptation uh, work program, but um, it, it does show the gap between mitigation action and everything that we've done to measure and understand progress towards that goal and the lack of understanding that we still have when it comes to tackling adaptation and making it such an urgent priority. And for me, that is critical in 2022 because we're going to an African COP and Africa uh, uh, main uh, concern uh, uh, was to make adaptation a global priority for everyone. And so I think that is a critical um, element that we should take back when thinking about measuring progress. And for me, yeah. measuring progress means reprioritizing adaptation to the point where we know that it is of critical importance to the same level as mitigation. And I would say also loss and damage. 
Thanks, Eddie. I'm really conscious we are almost out of time and I want to get in one more question, but I'm just going to ask Thomas, Anna and then Annika if they want to say something very quickly on the global response and then we'll do one final round of questions. Thomas, did you want to add anything to what's been said? Well, I do think, um, I do think that uh, one, one issue that, that also really rose to the top of the agenda is the question of uh, the that the transition needs to be just, which means uh, we need to have the social dimension of what happens to people in transition in mind as well. Um, I think one of, the, one of the most critical barriers to transition out of coal is the fact that there are coal workers mm. and coal mines and, and in, in, in large coal factories that will be hard hit uh, both in developed and developing countries. And we don't factor that in and, and have their, their future in mind. Um, we won't achieve the targets we're setting ourselves because mm -hmm. people are losing their livelihoods and, and are left stranded. And, and uh, we can talk about stranded assets, but we can't talk about stranded people. Uh, these, uh, that's simply not acceptable. And, uh, yeah. and I think what happened in Glasgow was also that, that people realized that this needed to be part of the overall uh, discussion and and it was taken seriously and and will be addressed going forward and we haven't really had that e even though we have the sustainable development goals that have a social yeah. dimension as part of them we've never taken that into the climate conversation and to me that, that is a pretty big thing thanks thomas anna did you want to add anything on the global issue no thank you i'm sure we'll that. annika i could just add a quick uh thing about just transition, because I agree there that, that the transition needs to be just, and I think that we can um, use some experiences from the pandemic. I know that, for example, we had some people working for a flight company here in Scandinavia, and they became nurses during the pandemic. And, and uh, we also saw that during the pandemic that we are able to change our lives if we have to. So uh, we know that we can do it, but uh, in the climate, to, to tackle the climate crisis, we need to do it in a positive way and not only like uh, we did during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah and you mentioned the, uh, the benefits also, you know, we need to talk about the benefits of some of these adaptation measures. Yeah. So I just want to say to the audience, before we go to our final question, thank you so much for sending in so many great questions. There'll be a questionnaire in your inboxes. If you could spend a couple of minutes answering that questionnaire for us, it'd be great. It means we can give you exactly the type of webinars that you want going forward. And as I said, if we don't get to answer your questionnaire, we will make sure they get answered um, behind the scenes after the webinar. We've had so many questions, so different as well. So the last two, I'm going to do put two questions together, but the panel member, you can answer one or either of these questions. And very quickly, I'm afraid, because we're already just a couple of minutes over our time. One question is, do you think nuclear energy is part of the solution going forward? Um, and the other one is, should cryptocurrencies be banned because of the huge amount of energy um, it requires? Uh, I think that's in terms of mining them. I'm not an expert on those issues, but uh, I think so. So what do you think about nuclear? What do you think about crypto? I know they're very different. We've gone from the big strategic down to kind of rather more detailed. Please answer one or either of those. Um, Eddie, you were smiling. I'm going to come to you for your thoughts on this. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, if you have read a little bit of Climate Action Network uh, position on nuclear, you'll know that my answer to that is going to be no, uh, for many reasons. Uh, trust is one of them. Uh, the, 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 the complexities to get that running, um, the, the disposal of, um, you know, what we do with the product, um, the fact that we're also talking about conservation and protection of uh, biodiversity land uh, and its impacts. If we try to think about this technology at scale, there are many reasons for me to doubt that nuclear is going to be uh, a critical part of the solution. Uh, and I would definitely focus on, you know, the recent studies that are showing uh, renewable energy prices dropping uh, to, to out of proportion to what the IPCC has projected in previous reports. And I would certainly focus on that uh, instead of uh, on nuclear, but you know, uh, that is also my, my opinion um, as Thanks, an activist. Eddie. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Eddie. Annika, your thoughts on nuclear or cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I think I will focus on the nuclear. Um, I do not think that this is a long-term solution. And 
uh, I mean, building new uh, nuclear plants is just not economically sane uh, today. Great, thanks, Annika. Jonas, I, I'm, I'm conscious that nuclear might be a bit political for an organisation like SAP, but do you have any thoughts on, on one or either of those issues? On the, the technical one, on cryptocurrency or on crypto um, technology, if you want to say. So there I see that it's not either or, so I'm not a big fan of simply banning them from, from any type uh, of, of purpose. But I think we should, should also make them not part of the problem, but part of the solution. So we see a lot now with um, supply chain transparency. So if you want to actually also track back and make sure that you have uh, human rights, not only um, ensured in a specific country, but across the whole value chain, then crypto technology uh, could actually be quite, quite helpful. So therefore, it's it's not either or. I I, I do see the the problem that we now have with with bitcoins, and that they are uh, a huge investment uh, or simply financial speculation. And I do not see that the benefit out of it yet. But this may could change. So I I, I would give cryptocurrencies uh, still a chance, or at least the technology is still a chance, even though there are some downsides. Thanks, Jonas. And we do do webinars, by the way, on fintech. So if you're interested in that, please do. Have a look because some of those issues come up there. Thomas, your thoughts on either of these? Well, I agree with those who've said that that nuclear isn't really part of my equation going forward. Uh, it's more expensive than renewables. It's more dangerous. Um, populations don't want it. In my country, we've said no to nuclear 45 years ago. Um, engineers will tell you that you can't run uh, an energy grid fully on renewables and you need some kind of base load. Uh, um, nuclear, gas, coal, uh, that's not true. Uh, they need to rewrite the engineering textbooks. We are running an energy system on renewables, but that's actually one of the most biggest barriers for the transition is to re-educate engineers in how to create a stable energy system that runs entirely on renewables. But they're all invited to Denmark. We run courses of civil servants from all around the world. That sounds fantastic. I would love to do that. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Anna, we started with you. I'm going to give you the final thoughts on this. Well, just uh, I mean, as a as a non-nuclear expert, actually, I can I can tap into um, what Annika, Eddy, and, and Thomas said. Um, you know, not not being an expert in the in the relative cost, but it would not be um, something that I would support as a member of public in in terms of investing because of the risks um, and be, you know because of the the issues of disposal, which don't I've not seen anything that have convinced me that those um, you know those dangers have been overcome. Really interesting. Thank you so much, Anne. Interesting that there was no kind of um, you know sense of we should be going for nuclear there. I wonder if that would be different with a slightly different panel, but really interesting to, to get that um, response here. We are sadly out of time. Thank you so much to the audience for sending in so many great questions. We could have gone on for another hour, but I know everybody is really, really busy. We will get those questions answered for you. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you so much for our amazing uh, panel um, to Anna, to Thomas, to Jonas, to Annika and to Eddie. Thank you so much for lending us so much of your time and sharing your expertise with us. It's been a brilliant discussion. And I think overall one that leaves me certainly with the sense that although we still have a long way to go, good progress has been made. We need to keep hold of that and uh, an optimism for the future. We absolutely can do this. And thank you to all the civil servants in the audience who are watching, because it's over to you now to make sure um, that we make this a reality and we make this happen. Um, a link will be shared of this webinar to everybody who has registered so you'll be able to watch the video again or share it with your colleagues. There will also be an article sent around with all of the key points which you can share with people as well that will come around in a couple of weeks time. Um, and also we are doing at Global Government Forum a webinar on a just transition supporting the shift to environmental sustainability um, on the 26th of April next year. So if you were interested in some of those issues that were raised today by Eddie and others, then you can sign up to that webinar as well. Thank you so much for everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day, wherever you are, whatever time of day it is. Um, and I hope to see you again very soon on another one of our webinars. Thanks to our great panel as well. Goodbye, everyone. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye-bye.